I had a youth leader when I was in middle school that shared a story with us about a time when he was first married. He and his wife were out at a restaurant, and his wife kept asking him, do you love me? And it wasn't that she doubted his love. I think it was more just that in that newlywed phase, she kind of still couldn't believe it. And she just loved hearing it over and over. So she asked, do you love me? Do you love me? And so my youth leader, he started thinking to himself, well, how, how can I prove to her that, yes, of course, I love her? And so he got up out of his chair, left the table, stepped into the aisle, right in the middle of all the seats and tables, and did a somersault right there in the middle of the restaurant. And just as every head in the entire place was turning to see what in the world was going on, he came up out of the somersault, raised his arms up in the air and said, shouted really, I love my wife. Which, I don't know if that proved it to her, but I don't think she asked again. But do you love me is, is one of the most important questions we can ask, either explicitly or implicitly in, our, in the relationships that we hold dear. And expressing that love is one of the most important things that we can do, especially in those closest relationships like marriages or deep friendships or close family ties. Having that real and deep committed love, which takes different forms in different relationships, but it's that same love that, that binds the relationship together, that personal relationship, that bond of love is so key to a thriving, uh, flourishing relationship. And so at the end of the Gospel of John, and by the way, we are wrapping up today what has been essentially a two-year journey through the Gospel of John. If you go all the way back to spring 2022, for Lent, we went through the signs, the miracles in the Gospel of John, and then we took a little bit of a break, and then last fall, we went through some of the other narrative portions of the first half of the Gospel of John, and then for just this past Lent and Easter, we've gone through the second part of the Gospel of John. We didn't hit absolutely everything, which means there's, there's more that we can come back to the next time, but today we're wrapping up. We're actually not going all the way to the very end of the Gospel. There's a few more verses, but this is essentially the last story uh, in the Gospel. And it's a story of Jesus coming to Peter. Peter, the one who, on the night when Jesus was basically on trial, when he was on trial and about to go to his death on the cross, Peter denied ever knowing him, completely turned away, said, I don't know him, I don't have anything to do with him. And Jesus comes to Peter, not with a, a lecture, and not, with, not berating him for his failure, but with this inviting question do you love me? And it confirms something that the Gospel of John has been showing us this whole time, and that is that when it comes to what Jesus wants from us, his disciples, what Jesus wants from us, from us, first and foremost, isn't our effort, it isn't our service, it isn't our intellect or our wealth or whatever other gifts we have, First and foremost, what Jesus wants is us. He wants to know that we love him, and he wants us to know that how much he loves us. And of course, when we deeply love Jesus and we deeply know his love, it will lead to effort and service. It will lead to giving our gifts, our intellect, our wealth, or whatever other gifts he's given to us, and using them to witness to his kingdom and bring his name glory, but first and foremost, what he wants is, is us. Just us. So let's jump into the text, and then we'll talk a little more about it. John chapter 21, starting at verse 15. And by the way, uh, one last bit of context here. This story is a continuation, direct continuation on the story we read last week. So that was the miraculous catch of fish. They come ashore. Jesus has got uh, uh, breakfast going, and he says, come and have breakfast with me. And we talked about how Jesus meets us in those ordinary moments like breakfast. And this is, this is what happens right after that. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, 
do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And he said to him, follow me. Many times this story is referred to as the reinstatement of Peter. And that's because this story is a callback to Peter's utter failure. If you go back to John chapter 13, uh, Jesus is talking about going to his death, and Peter pipes up, confidently proclaiming, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus responds, and I, with, I think, sadness, but sadness because of his love, he responds, will you really lay down your life for me? And then he goes on to predict that Peter will disown him three times uh, by the next morning, which, of course, is exactly how it goes. And I think that's what makes Peter uh, such a, a broken and therefore relatable character for us, uh, at least for me, and I hope I'm not the only one in the room that can relate to having moments of wanting to do it, and, you know, do the right thing, and then blowing it. And I don't know about you, but those moments of blowing it often lead to feelings of guilt and shame and deep feelings of inadequacy and insecurity and questions of, well, if I'm supposed to be following Jesus in this, does he really, does he really want me to keep following, right? Uh, is, does, is his love still for me? Um, but we have here at the end of the Gospel of John this beautiful story of incredible good news for us disciples who have a tendency to blow it. Because it is exactly at this point that Jesus enters in. And you'll notice Jesus comes to Peter. He seeks Peter out. He says, you know, you had breakfast, and they go, hey, Peter, come aside. And I want to I talk with you. And that's Jesus extending his grace to Peter. It's exactly at the moment of failure that Jesus says, I, my grace is for you. And, it, it, and it's not just grace like, don't worry about it, it's fine. This is a full-blown restoration, a reinstatement. Even for Peter, this one who denied Jesus in his greatest moment of need. And if our Lord is loving and gracious enough to re-extend that invitation to Peter, we can be sure that his love and his grace is for us too. We all, uh, series long on the Gospel of John, we've been, I should say, I've been relying heavily on a scholar named Dale Bruner and his commentary. Uh, the same is true for today, and he has a great quote about this. Bruner puts it like this. He says, Jesus entrusts exactly such very human people. Jesus takes people who qualify exactly as much as Peter does, i.e., people who have failed, sometimes quite awfully, for his mission to the world. Isn't that good news? Yes. It gets at one of the fundamental elements of the Christian faith, and that is that little word, grace. Grace is at the center of what it means to follow Jesus. Because grace means that our failures, our shortcomings, our sins, 
In fact, do not disqualify us from receiving God's forgiveness and hearing his compassionate words once again. Do you love me? We've got more work to do. Grace means that when we are faced with our own sin or failures, those things that make us feel shame and guilt, that is exactly the point when we can begin to see what Jesus has done for us most clearly. We look to the cross and we see Jesus suffering and death on our behalf and we can be absolutely sure that our sin and our failure is done away with. We can be confident of his great love for us. Grace means that when we have blown it, there is something that we can do other than wallow in our guilt and our shame, as some of us tend to do. Grace means that there is something that when we're faced with our failure and sin and shortcomings, there is something that we can do other than sweep it under the rug or pretend it didn't happen, or try to justify it in some way, which some of us have a tendency of doing. And maybe we've realized that usually that doesn't work out so well for us. Grace means there's something we can do when we've blown it. We don't have to wallow in guilt, and we don't have to pretend like it never happened. We can be honest and open and vulnerable and know that we are still loved and know that we are forgiven. And that's exactly when Jesus' work of renewal can begin in our hearts. Jesus asks Peter that question three times. And part of that repetition is, of course, to remind Peter of his three denials. And I think that's why it says Peter was so hurt when Jesus asked him the third time, because he knows what Jesus is getting at. But again, Jesus doesn't ask him those questions three times to say, to to emphasize Peter's guilt or his shame. It's to make sure that Peter knows that, yes, Jesus still loves him. Even though he denied Jesus three times. But there's something else that's being emphasized here with this repetition. It's not only that Jesus' grace is sufficient for Peter's failure. It's, It's the fact that this question, do you love me? Is, is really the one and only question that really matters for us disciples who follow Jesus. Do you love me? Do you really love, deeply love Jesus and that relationship with him? That is the first and most important question. And it, it can be a real challenge to, to think you know, honestly about that, especially I'll go first. For for pastors and for church leaders, for staff members, when when loving Jesus is sort of strangely part of our job description, and and we're, you know, we're sort of just expected to do that as part of our responsibilities to grow in our love for Jesus. So what does that look like when our when our paycheck relies on it? But I think for all of us disciples and followers of Jesus, it can be easy for our walk with Jesus to become a sort of to-do list or just a responsibility or a burden or an expectation that we feel that either we place on ourselves or maybe we feel somebody else placing that on us. And our walk with Jesus can just be, I gotta do this and I gotta do that and we'll tick these boxes off. When the real question is, do we love Jesus? I'm sure You all remember the medieval English bishop by the name of St. Richard of Chichester? Show of hands. (laughs) I was not familiar with him until earlier this week either. Uh, But he wrote a prayer that has become somewhat well-known, and I'd heard of it in different contexts. By the way, is the screen working or no? Not really? Hey, there it is. It's just my click. Oh, is my clicker working now too? There we go. Um, This was his prayer. Um, He prayed to Jesus, I want to know you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly. And it's become uh, somewhat more popular. It was put to song in the musical Godspell, if you're familiar with that. I meet with a spiritual director uh, once a month, and he introduced me to this prayer. And he pointed out that 
you know, there's three parts to the prayer, right? Know Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus. And that following comes last. Following, which we associate most with what do I do? Right? How do I act? How do I serve Jesus? How do I follow him? That one comes last. Now, of course, if you really know Jesus personally and love him deeply, then following will follow. But my director wanted me to see that many times for us disciples, it can be easier, in a sense, to just skip to the following bit, right? What do you want me to do for you, Jesus? What does it mean to follow you? You want me to become a pastor and pastor a church plant? I can do that. You want me to open up a nonprofit organization to help people find affordable housing in the Southwest Metro? Sure, let's do that. That sounds great. I'm not doing that, by the way, but maybe we should do that. Um, you want me to pray and read my Bible daily? Check, check, check. And you can fill in the blanks of what that is for you, those expectations. Those are not bad things to do, by the way, but you notice how you can do all of those things without actually developing a warmth and love for Jesus which is what he wants from us. Which is, in, in many ways, it's, it's doing less work, right? To, to simply get to know Jesus and love him and cultivate that, that uh, relationship with him. Ultimately, what Jesus wants from us is us. He wants our love and he wants us to know his love. And again, this is what the Gospel of John has been so good at showing us from the beginning, that Jesus reveals to us that our God is the relational God, that Jesus, God himself, became flesh and moved into the neighborhood, as Eugene Peterson puts it, and that Jesus, when approached by those first disciples, simply said, follow me, come hang out for the afternoon, remain with me. Think about what this means. Because we could hear these questions, do you love me, do you love me, as almost sort of, come on, Jesus, like, are you, are you that needy that you need my love? That's not what it is. It's more like this. Think about what it means when you want someone else to love you. Think about what that person means to you that you want their love. It means that they mean the world to you and their feelings toward you are of utmost importance to you. Like my youth leader and his wife, how they meant the world to each other. And so forgive me if this sounds a little cheesy, but this means that you and I mean the world to Jesus that he would desire more than our actions and activities and our effort, that he just desires us to be with him. And it's out of that love, it's following after that love that we get this call to discipleship that uh, Peter hears as, feed my sheep. Take care of the ones that I have brought into my fold. And the first and most obvious way to understand what Jesus is saying here is take care of those that I'm bringing into the church. Those who are already there and those that I am bringing in. And so many times we associate this passage with pastors and elders and deacons, right? Those who are ordained uh, to lead the flock in special particular ways. And by the way, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, voting on and installing new elders and deacons next month. And that certainly applies to uh, those of us in those positions. But this can apply to other volunteers as well. Of course, the children's ministry uh, volunteers who are uh, right now, as uh, I speak, uh, feeding the littlest lambs of the flock, reminding them of Jesus' love. The gems leaders who week in and week out uh, share God's love with uh, the girls' youth ministry. Sunday school teachers of that Sunday school that we're going to launch in the fall. Worship leaders who every Sunday are up here putting, helping us put the words of God's love on our mouths and our lips as we sing and reminding us of his love for us. And, but this isn't just for uh, volunteers. This can apply to anyone, even if you're not in one of those roles. Feed my sheep can mean uh, taking a fellow church member out for coffee and just asking how it's going. 
And I think it's fair to say that Jesus' call to feed my sheep can extend even more broadly than that, outside of the walls of the church, to those that Jesus has put in our midst, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities. That is hopefully, by the way, what the book study on bless will kind of help us live out. In this broader sense, Jesus' words here basically mean, and again, I'm drawing heavily on Bruner, they basically mean take good care of the people that Jesus has entrusted to you in some way. So parents who have been entrusted with young children or adult children. Adult children entrusted with aging parents. Uh, In your neighborhood, you are entrusted with your neighbors and the people nearby you. Uh, At your work, you're entrusted with your coworkers or with your clients or your customers. Sometimes the people Jesus has entrusted to you simply means the people Jesus has brought nearby to you. How can you pray for And by the way, you don't need to even let them know that you're praying for them. You can just pray for the people near you. How can you listen? Deeply listen. Ask curious questions. Get to know people more deeply. And find out how you can serve with those uh, in your midst. One final note. Uh, This passage ends on a rather ominous note. Uh, Jesus references Peter's death. And many people have interpreted Jesus' words here to mean that Peter, like Jesus, will endure crucifixion, right? That his arms will be stretched out, and that means on a cross. And we see that, indeed, uh, Peter's love, uh, will, uh, love for Jesus, will go all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. Many Christians across the centuries have been called to follow in Peter's path to martyrdom. Many, probably all, of us here in this room uh, will not be called to that path. But even if we are not martyrs for the faith, what we can learn from Jesus' words here is that when we love Jesus deeply, and when we answer his call to feed his sheep, when we're on that road of discipleship, It seems that a certain amount of suffering comes with the territory. And we shouldn't be surprised or alarmed by that. Discipleship comes with a cost, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer teaches us so well in his best-known book, The Cost of Discipleship the cost of following after Jesus. And if you've been following along with the Lectio 365 app this past week, um, you were reminded that, I believe it was Tuesday, was the anniversary of Bonhoeffer's death when he was executed in a Nazi concentration camp. Uh, Before he was killed, he wrote compellingly about the life of discipleship. And he pricks our consciences a little bit. And helps us to see that many of us are content, a little too content sometimes, to live with what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. This idea that we see the life of discipleship and following Jesus as something that will hopefully just make our life a little bit better, and that we can enjoy the benefits of salvation with almost no cost to us. Of course, Jesus' grace is free to us, But in order to live it out fully, as Bonhoeffer helps us see, it's not really, we're not really experiencing the fullness of Jesus' grace if we leave it there on that level of cheap grace. We're missing out on the full and deep life to which we've been called, which is a costly grace. Bonhoeffer puts it like this. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. Forgive the gender-exclusive language, but of course this applies to men and women. Jesus' call to follow me and to feed my sheep, it, it might come with a cost. It might cost you your reputation. It might cost you time. 
and energy. It might cost you money. But we can be confident that the cost is not the end of the story. And that, in fact, when we endure those costs, it is the way of true life, meaningful life, satisfying, full life. And that's because the one we're following went through it too. The cost of discipleship brought Jesus all the way to the cross, giving up his life for us. But he came through it to the other side of suffering and death into resurrected full life. It was costly because it cost Jesus his life. And it is grace because in doing that, he extends his life to us. And now he calls us to follow him in the same way, through whatever the cost may be of following him, of feeding his sheep, that is the way of knowing his grace, and that is the way of true and full life. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, help us this week to hear your voice, inviting us to love you more deeply. We pray that you would warm our hearts toward you. Help us to see more clearly what you have done for us, and may our love for you deepen. And as that love deepens, we pray that we would hear your gracious call to serve you and to love our neighbors, our friends, our family, anyone you've placed in our midst and entrusted to us to share that love with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.